welcome to this Forum for Philosophy event at the LSE. Um, my name is Danielle Sands and I'm a fellow at the Forum. I'm going to be chairing this evening's event in which we talk about silence. We tend to view silence as the opposite of speech, but silence also communicates. There is considerable interest in free speech, but what about the ability to remain silent? Does silence have a particular value? And how can we achieve it in our busy, noisy world? Examining perspectives from across philosophy, religion and political thought will challenge assumptions about silence, questioning its relation to thinking and asking whether it might serve as a form of political resistance. Let me introduce our speakers for this evening. Rachel Muirs is Professor of Theology at the University of Leeds. Monica Vieira is Professor of Political Theory at the University of York. And Naomi Wortham Smith is Reader in Philosophy at the University of Warwick. We'll have lots of time for questions at the end, so please do put your questions in the chat for us. Rachel, perhaps you can start things off. What is it that we understand when we talk about silence? So when I'm training um, postgraduates who are teaching in higher education, once or twice, I've put out a question. Um, a you're running a seminar, a group tutorial, a discussion group, and there's a student who's not saying anything, who's silent. Why? We think about it. Normally, the first kinds of answers that come to mind are answers that define the silence of the student as an absence or a lack. So they're not talking because they haven't done the work, they don't understand what's going on, they haven't got any ideas. And we quite often do read silence like that, right? Um, silence is just um, the edge of what we know about, the edge of what we can talk about, and it's not interesting. If we notice it at all, we notice it as something that needs to be filled, that's waiting to be filled, maybe even as a problem to be fixed. So then we think some more about the silent student. And we think, maybe this is actually somebody who's listening very intently. Maybe this is somebody who's thinking about all of the ideas at once. Maybe this is somebody who is taking the time in silence that it would need to allow some kind of new speech or new idea to emerge. And that's understanding silence as something that's actually fuller than speech, that's capable of holding many things together over time with the prospect of, 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 of something new appearing. Silence as, as plenitude, if you like. Um, silence as a space of possibility. Um, silence as an opening that might also be a cut or an interruption in the ordinary way that we're going on. The pause that we might need, the break that we might need in order to change. And then we think about the silent student and we might think about the, the relational space. That, that student's occupying and silence as something um, relational, something embodied as a way of being present, as a way of being present in that space, um, silence as um, communicating certain kinds of emotional um, tone or sense that isn't, um, that wouldn't be picked up in speech. And we might think about cultural factors um, and social factors that would make that silence mean different things for different people in different kinds of contexts. And in all of that, we might have got a bit better at listening to silences, right? Um, so we're picking up what is going on around the edges and in the background um, of speech, at how speech is being contextualized, at how it's being enabled, what kind of listening is going on, um, and how we can become the kind of listeners how we can set up the silence, if you like, that will allow speech to emerge, how we can hear people into speech. So there are lots of different, lots of different possibilities of silence at play. And the interesting thing about that little example, is you can see them happening on the really, on the really micro level, interpersonal interactions, the, the difference between the silence when you haven't got anything to say and the silence when you've got too much to say, <laughs> the silence when you don't know what to say yet and the silence when you've said everything. Right? We can see these even on, 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 on little um, uh, interpersonal relations, but we can also see how they play out um, at, at social levels, at political levels, and, we, and, and in a fairly, at a fairly deep level in thinking about philosophies and theologies of, of silence. Um, 
But one of the things that I've also tended to pick up about, up about silence is that mostly the first time you say it, people know, think they know what you mean. And then as soon as they stop and think about it, um, they realise the multiple um, senses that it can have. Thanks, Rachel. I want to pick up on this idea that you said at the beginning about our default um, approach to silence is to assume that it's a kind of absence. Um, why do we do that? And, and what does it tell us about how we understand speech in our culture? Monica, I wonder why, whether you want to respond to that. You're on mute. I typically do this, my students know this. So I, I think we definitely live in a culture that is speech centric and, and whatever is not added to speech as an Italian philosopher has put it, uh, is discounted as irrelevant or seen as a menacing exterior to how we define the human, how do we define the political, right? So our model of democracy is a voice model of democracy in which your presence depends on having a say and as a sizing voice. Of course, this is also connected more fundamentally with logocentrism and the idea that there is a tight connection between rational thought and the capacity for speech. And in logocentrism, I mean, thought is taken to be something essential that is mediated first through speech, right? And the closer the signifier stands to the signified, the more it can bring the two into presence, the more it can confer it a presence. And in this view of things, we can end up with this idea, right, that, that uh, everything that is connected to presence, subjectivity, identity, agency, power, all come to be seen as conferred primarily by speech. And silence comes to be seen as in, an, in a dominant way that we have seen it, uh, most of us see it as negative and conceptualized as an absence of, of speech and therefore as an absence of subjectivity, identity, agency, and power. And I, I think that's that's kind of like where it comes from. But I was I was kind of before coming here, I was kind of not noting down what I think are effects and problematic effects of this way of thinking. This transfers then into politics, right? In which political, politically speaking, silence stands for the absence of political voice. And voice being the way of presence, right? It's very complicated because you disappear from the political space. You cannot expect political power to see you, to convey your preferences. You cannot expect to be represented because representation supposedly depends on this prior presence and the presence that is articulated fully for voice into preferences, right? So here you have, again, the dichotomy between silence as absence and speech as pre presence. Silence as non-participation speech as participation, silence as exclusionary speech as inclusive. However, I would say that this framework of things, right, where you have this framework that separates both in, in a kind of very strong oppositional way, has uh, paradoxical effects, and I wanted to mention three of them. One is that the conceptualization of silence as an absence demotes silence as an object of study. If nothing is there, why look at it at all? Why bother, right? This is very, very problematic. Uh, and it's very problematic. One way to see that is this problematic is that we are lacking the methodological tools still in, uh, with which in, to tap into silence, right? So there is kind of like this, how do you do? Because of course surveys don't tap into silence or sit in silence because they, the ones that participate in surveys are those inclined to, to speak in the first instance. So you get through this problem. So you have to do more ethnographic work, more slow kind of work that where you probe the silence, you kind of inspect the silence and listen out to silence. And what I think is, is very problematic is that here we, kind of forget that silence, even what I call, I tend to distinguish between commissive silence and omissive silence, silence that, that you choose to do and, and silence that you do not, don't choose to do. And effectively, even omissive silence is a doing, is a produced, and very often is produced by communities, right? So the silence of uh, denial, for instance, the silence of political apathy is not natural or a default condition. It is produced and very often sustained by communities, right? It's very, it's very often hard work to ignore a problem. 
Uh, and and there are uh, there are really interesting uh, studies about, for instance, the environmental problems that some communities are facing in Norway, where they see it every day and they don't speak about it. And and we need to kind of see silence as a communitary production, even in, in, when it is omissive, and see what it lies behind this production. Why do people keep doing it, right? What, what are the fears that they face? What is the, the curtailed sense of agency that they have that lends, it, lends them to do this in this way and produce silence? So I think this is quite important. Now, another effect is that when you treat silence as an absence, that might be one of the best ways to reproduce silencing, right? And to kind of forget that uh, not uh, forget that in that way you are naturalizing and normalizing communicative dimensions of structural epistemic and hermeneutic forms of injustice to borrow from Rachel's work if you see silence as, as something that marks a, an actual presence or a potential presence an actual speaker or potential speaker then your attention is turned into these potential forms of um, structural epistemic and hermeneutical injustice that produce silencing and the absence of silence. These Monica, are... sorry to jump in. Can you just explain for us those those terms you've just yeah, used? Yeah, I will, I will, I will exactly this. So if you see silence as a communicative communicative dimension of these forms of injustice, you will see that silence is a, is not an empirical fact but a social construction, right? So here you are thinking of for, for instance, uh, why do different people at different um, access or levels at, uh, of access to voice platforms? So can they be excluded by lack of access? So speech is also very costly, right? To exercise speech, to, to exercise speech in a way that speaks to power is just accessible to some. So that's another form of exclusion. But most speech is silenced, not because people don't speak, but because others don't listen. And your capacity to speak is premised on the fact that you feel that you might be listened and you are listened to. So here you, you see that, that your capacity to, to speak depends primarily on audience uptake, right? So when you speak about epistemic, uh, uh, epistemic um, injustice, it's because you are not credible. Your testimony is not believed. You are just an object of knowledge rather than an agent of knowledge. All of this can produce silencing. That happens very often with members of marginalized communities, racial, ethnic, and otherwise. And hermeneutical injustice has to do with the silence that is produced by the fact that you don't have a language in which to articulate your experience or your demands. And this is also a problem, a, 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 a very often a problem that arises from structural injustice, relations of power in our society, but also from historical injustices that live into the present. So treating silence as presence of a potential or actual speaker immediately calls your attention to this these processes that might be going on, these structural features, whereas treating it as absence might take your attention from it. So I think that's another important uh, way in which it, one might want to avoid treating silence as absence. And the other thing that I think this does, treating silence uh, as absence, is that it dismisses outright the potential for agency that lies in silence and the potential for agency that might be different and not just like the kind of agency that is enabled by speech. So these three effects, I think, come from our treatment of silence or potentially come from a treatment of silence as the absence of something. And that something normally is thought to be speech. Thanks, Monica. I think one thing that's coming clear already is that we're using uh, this single word silence to function in lots of different ways. Um, and actually that maybe we need um, more subtle terminology to be able to make sense of these different kind of actions and processes that fall under this umbrella. Um, Nemi, I wonder whether you might want to, to pick up on this question of um, different types of functioning of silence or the different types of silence. Yeah, I think so. And maybe I um, can also put it in the context of something Rachel said, which was to think of silence as a kind of source or a, an opening, a condition of possibility. So when I, I think of silence as being, you know, I've noted down here, silence and silences can say a lot. And I, maybe I want to insist on that silences in the plural, because I think silence is very polysemous. So 
In other words, that means it can carry a number of different meanings or can evade meaning in a number of different ways or strategies. And I like to think of silence as being something that kind of disseminates itself and works in different kinds of ways, that it's something we try to gather under this category of silence, but it operates in a number of ways. But I think unlike Monica and, and Rachel, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick a point of controversy already so early on. <laughs> I don't think the solution is simply to say that instead of associating silence with absence, we need to associate it with presence. Rather that we can think about the ways in which silence is um, put in question that very opposition between presence and absence. And I, I thought of two examples, um, two different contexts that, that could help illustrate this. Um, one is more around texts and literature, the other one is around ecological issues. So let's just think of this very uh, stereotypical idea that we find in, in philosophy, especially in political philosophy, but also in aesthetics of the voice uh, and writing. And so writing is sort of considered to be the silent partner, if you like, of that binary opposition. Voice is the one with sound, writing the one with the absence of sound. And yet let's think about what happens to the voice in writing. When we write, we leave gaps between words. We leave gaps between sentences, between paragraphs. And in poetry, these are often foregrounded, thematized, performed more dramatically, but also in, in, in some genres of, of literary work where people play with the, the white space on the page. And that white space appears to be a kind of manifestation, a textual inscription of silence. But what it's really there to inscribe is the fact that there were breaths that needed to be taken. So it's a kind of surreptitious way of writing down the voice, of inscribing the presence on the page, but in the guise of some kind of absence or some kind of blank space. And someone like Malame is someone who thinks about the, these conditions of, of the blanks. And then after Malame, a thinker, a philosopher like Jacques Derrida will make hay with this idea of blank spaces uh, to, to completely deconstruct this opposition between absence and presence, voice and writing. So that's a rather more technical one. Uh, and the other one is maybe more approachable, which is let's think about the silent spring. So this is the case of when uh, bird migration patterns have changed or ecosystems have been damaged to such an extent that bird song or, and other animal sounds, insect sounds, but primarily birds and, and, and insects, that the soundscape will be completely transformed. And Bernie Krauser has done some amazing, like devastating work showing this. So we think there of silence as being the index of an absence the absence of birds, the absence of animal life, uh, of just organic life and its future potential. But it's also the index of another kind of presence, the presence of anthropogenic intervention, the cause of global warming and climate change. It inscribes uh, industrial capitalism in sound, in the kind of traces of sound, in vanishing traces of sound. And I think there are other ways in which we do this, just to touch on a few of them. I'm sure we'll come back to the political questions. I just want to brush on them very briefly. But there are other occasions where we use uh, silence, not to convey absence or presence, one or the other, but to show that these two things cannot be so disentangled. Life and death, if you like, are are often different to disentangle, that it might not bring an end, an absolute extinction. It might also be a kind of life that is struggling to breathe or is suffocated in some way. So I'm thinking about the use of uh, silent vigils to mark Grenfell, for instance, that is there not simply to mark the deaths, the lives that are lost, but also the kind of conditions of suffocation under which certain parts of a population continue to live in the 21st century, or the Marche Blanche uh, for victims of police brutality in the Quartier Populaire in France, that are often in fact not silent. Um, but again, that image of the, the white space as something that is silent is, is in that name there of the Marche Blanche. So I think, you know, I just wanted to kind of complicate these ideas of presence mm -hmm. and absence or the association with kind of 
silence and life or silence and death and extinction and, and just point out a few i could point to all kinds of things uh, to which silence can do i noted down a few it, it can show assent or withdrawal refusal or consensus it can be calming or fearful it can be a threat a rebellion but it also can be quiet acceptance or submission renunciation so i think these things often complicate uh they can include mixtures of being present and being withdrawn. And I think that's something I think we're all, all touching on already that silence can do and be many things. You know, I, I would I'd say to that that I fully agree. I think what I was saying is that if you see the silence, silence that you see as the mark of a, an absent presence, right? That 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 calls your attention to certain things that you might dismiss otherwise. But it's the mark of an absent presence, and therefore it's not absence or presence. It is something trade trading between because I think the danger here is to do um, a binary in reverse right to just change the terms and continue working within the binary and I think we are all engaging in the deconstruction of the binary binary as such and that's a project that we are trying to do by looking into silence rather than just speech so well, it's a question about temporality as well isn't it I mean the, the, this 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 is what really struck me in what you were saying Naomi that that um the, the the spaces on the page one of the things that they're doing you could argue um is emphasizing the time takingness of the word and that already also you could say shifts how you think about presence and absence right because there is there is something coming there is something that will be said well okay it's not here yet but it's on its way so we don't have this oh well it's either it's either real or it's not real we have the categories of potentiality we have categories of futurity um and that to me is it, that's actually one of the really significant things philosophically about silence is that it takes time um and the other the other the other side of it would be embodiment right um mm -hmm. so that would 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 the, the the sense that um to talk about um silent presence is to draw attention to a body but then that's not to that's also to draw attention to the body in time and the body with its um, possibilities potentialities um losses so on and so forth yeah i really like what this emphasis on sort of the potentiality of silence because if you think about it in a moment of silence it's possible both to remain silent or for silence to remain or for silence to be kind of broken. broken. So it exists, it's, it's kind of, but it is also, you know, that contingency is also a part of silence. And I think that that's something that's really coming out in this conversation. Yeah, now going to the moment of silence, I think there is then a symmetry, which is important uh, between silence and speech is that one person can break silence and to keep silence, many people are necessary. So, so that that's kind of like again. I think it's it's it just shows that they are not exactly the same thing, right? Because a moment of silence, a person that makes noise can completely ruin it. Um, and where and, and to keep that silence, we need the cooperation of everyone. You cannot keep silence alone. Not even your own silence. You can keep alone if you are with others, right? You, they have to sustain your silence as well they have to they have to be there to support and sustain it over time which is quite important in terms of you think of the creation of community when you think it through silence i find this very appealing but you can probably see i think rachel and i are pondering this we're thinking is that really the case because i can also think of moments that might be incredibly powerful where one person can keep silence amid something that is incredibly noisy but i'm also very attracted to your quite like political idea that silent like keeping silence requires a kind of solidarity uh, solidarity or a solidary kind of approach that it, it cannot be appropriated that it's not of the regime of property ownership in the same way but I'm also quite conflicted about that what that means mm. uh it's an intriguing question I want to keep thinking <laughs> I like the sense also of the sort of unpredictability that you get with the moment of silence that we're all saying that it can be sustained or broken in a variety of different ways but there's something rich in the the not knowing and also something I think unmasterable in that sort of not knowing that it doesn't Nobody has complete control over it or that has control over the situation in a way that they can um, predict what's going to happen. I yeah, wonder if we could 
go, go ahead. Mike. No, I mean, it's the interesting no. thing with the with the John Cage quote unquote silent piece, isn't it? I mean, I mean, if you go to performances of that piece, um, they're all they're all radically different. Um, it's uh, and um, there is something about that what happens is not written down on the on the page. I mean, what precisely the way you the way you perform that piece is you 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 create a space within which there's very limited control of what happens and you attend to to what happens and that, that actually that was one of the reasons i was thinking about monica's comment because in a sense the the performance of the of the john cage piece um it, it sets it, one of the ways i experience is that it sets up a a silence that holds all the sounds that happen to happen mm -hmm. while it's going on. Um, so it, so so on the one hand, you could say, yeah, silence is very, very fragile. It only takes one sound and it breaks. Mm -hmm. um, but there are contexts in which that's that's not the case, or that's not experienced as being as being the the case. Um, no, I I'd, I'd say that that's effectively one thing that one needs to say of. Uh, about silence is that it's very difficult to sustain an ontology of silence, whether it's A or B, right? I mean, when you said about silence and vulnerability, right? Silence can be uh, can be a kind of fortress, right? Because you can you can be responsive for silence, make yourself irresponsive for silence. So when a decision is taken and there is no other level that you can use. For instance, in a court case, right? It's it's silence. I'm not accountable anymore. It's closing the conversation, right? So, but at the same time, silence and in particular the silence of listening comes with a vulnerability that is very courageous, right? Because it's I'm open to what comes from you. I don't know what comes from you. I'm open to engaging it and to receiving. I'm not taking it and engaging it seriously and thinking through what I thought before critically, possibly when confronted with it. And this. Kind of puts a stress. I, I I really like this transvaluation of silence that occurs because normally it's the coward, those who don't have an opinion, those etc. that we think that keep silence. But effectively, I think it's quite brave uh, when when it's a form of receptiveness. So basically, here you see that silence is neither A or B, can be one or the other, and both. Uh, so so that that's that's the difficulty. But at the same, you could say about speech, right? Um, you cannot make essentialist claims about the nature of silence, right? It, 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 it would uh, bring you to be, to be uh, to many objections that you'd have to meet and you would be incapable of meeting them as we are seeing. I like what you were saying about the power of silence. I know that's one of the things we wanted to talk about a little bit that when silence can be incredibly powerful um, and I think beside, you were talking about receptivity but that that's the kind of power when it shows like attention mm -hmm. like I think sometimes silence is produced um, by virtue of like listening attention it doesn't mean there's an absence of sound but it can mean mm -hmm. um, there's a certain quieting of um, the inner voice or the inner monologue um, but I was also thinking you know in pol political dimensions that um, discretion at times may be something that's valued by the capitalist class to protect their interests but discretion also has a, a kind of function within resistance you know you can take a limit case of something like uh, refusing to speak under torture refusing to give yourself away to confess uh, perhaps not under torture we can move away from the limit case but simply refusing to confess to something refusing to disclose refusing to rat someone else out as a, as a particular form of sort solidarity mm -hmm. but I think especially in an era when transparency is wielded not simply in the sort of enlightenment fashion of exposing but almost like a kind of now thinking about how do we resist a kind of excess a kind of authoritarian turn in enlightenment where one instead says that keeping silence is a form of resisting those demands to be accountable, the demand to give an answer, the demand to reveal oneself. And I was thinking particularly of um, this work, which I, I'd shown you earlier, Rachel and Monica, this beautiful book by uh, the French psychoanalyst, uh, late psychoanalyst and philosopher Anne Dufourmontel, where she writes in defense of the secret. Mm -hmm. um, and psychoanalysis is this kind of whole structure that is about revealing or giving something up that is hidden. 
and quite against the grain of psychoanalysis. She talks about the need for an inner reserve. Uh, she calls it also a secret garden. Um, and the need to listen to that as a form of silence, um, but also the need to conserve it, to guard it, to protect it mm -hmm. as a form of care for the self, also care for the others. But, and she begins to hint at this at the end, also like care for the world around us. So many of those ecological examples that I pointed out are actually caused by human noise, um, causing a sort of uh, disintegration of, of animal uh, or natural world, organic world sort of soundscapes um, through intervention of industrial sound and, and so on. So one can think of like keeping silence as also a means of protecting and caring for every, everything from like guarding your best friend's secrets um, through, you know, or not revealing state secrets or protecting mm -hmm. the identity of activists through to maybe um, guarding the cruel word or holding back something mm. out of love for someone or or something like that uh, as, as well as maybe not creating noise pollution. I really like that because very often it's thought that the power in silence has to be created by disambiguating silence right by making it illegible or say something concrete and I think that misses the point because I think exactly what you are saying right producing um, unknowability, producing um, non-legibility is part of the power in silence, right? That resides in silence, which is a, pro a, a power of self-care, of protection and of protecting one another, right? So uh, sociability is not just uh, based on the things we say, but sec the secrets we keep for one another, right? And I think, I think that's really important because very often silence is connected to solitude, to, to withdrawal, right? To, to a kind of getting out of social relations. But I think exactly it's necessary to keep also in distance. And uh, so you brought that and I thought it was really critical because very often we think that it's through this ambiguation and telling clear messages through the communicative sense meanings of silence being uh, push forward or brought out that silence can become powerful. And there's also something really interesting to me in reserving the right not to know yet, um, mm. not to um, have a definite, a formed opinion yet, mm. not to have anything to say just yet, mm. or not to be ready to tell you just yet. So that's back to this sense about temporality. Um, so, but the I, I really like this idea that in, in the contemporary context, which is very um, immediate, very, um, you know, mm. you must say now, you must decide now, you must choose now, you must take now, you must say now. Um, there's something very powerful simply in refusing to, like you say, to disambiguate yourself, refusing to choose now, refusing to put yourself on the line right now. And that, and that is, yes, that it's part of self-care, but it also is actually a significant social um, and relational move, right? Because it's also, um, it, it, to, to, to me, actually, it has, it has something to do with uh, notions of forgiveness or of grace in advance, right? Of be, being allowed to be, being allowed to be unsure, um, <laughs> being allowed to take time um, and um, allowing others to be unsure and to take time um, and, and making, making spaces for the kind of silence which, as you say, doesn't need to explain itself instantly in order mm -hmm. to be made, um, in order to be allowed to be there. I really like that idea and you can think of it in unfolding and I think Duformal Tull talks a lot about how silence and secrets are essential for intimacy, which seems counterproductive, right? Because there's also this little story, you know, you reveal all in, in your romantic relationships, you must show all of yourself until you do that, you're, you're not fully committed or mm -hmm. um, that trust somehow requires this transparency. And yet what I really like about her work is the way in which it says that not yet and being able to, as it were, like hold on to oneself, preserve something of oneself in silence mm. is a key ingredient to intimacy because it's, it's about then retaining something that is not yet knowable or does not need to be known. And that disclosing that is actually a kind of act of vulnerability and showing that to others by, by sort of saying, well, 
I don't need to be fully known even to myself or to you, but this is part of an unfolding temporality that just will be the intimacy between us. And I think that, that that's quite interesting um, as an idea on that level. And if you think of that sort of also politically, I think it can be very, very strong in the sense that, you know, it, it can be almost quite aggressive to, to be silent, but I think it can also show a kind of resolve, um, perhaps. Um, in I'm thinking of situations where silence might be used in kind of activism or, or by political dissidents. And I think it, that can show a kind of um, ability to hold on to oneself or to hold on to the integrity of the movement or one's ideals um, against a sort of barrage of demands to give account. And then, and it's, again, that's that sort of like saying, not yet, or you can't make it fully legible, intelligible, knowable. You can't give a full account of its depths in some way. And I, I think that can be quite unnerving um, to one's political opponents as well because you, you can't take the full measure of what you're up against. Uh, so yeah, I think it has both these sides. One of like interpersonal intimacy that is not maybe hostile or aggressive, but, but it can also be a sign of political power, I think, it, uh, used by those who are oppressed um, to resist a uh, compelling force over them. I, I just want to jump in with a reminder to our viewers that you can put your questions in a chat and we will get to them shortly. But I wonder if we can dig a bit deeper, Monica, onto this idea of the association between uh, silence and political agency in a context where we tend to think of, of silence as, as, as being forced to be silent rather than something as, as generative or proactive. So I think when you see the work of political theorists uh, with silence, they normally think that silence has uh, some fragilities that uh, are at least a higher with respect to silence than they are with respect to speech. One is that it is ambiguous, and because of that, it is susceptible to appropriation, misinterpretation, uh, misdirecting, distortion, and etc. Right? And if that's the case, right, then the, the question is: How do you disambiguate silence? How do you uh, account for communicative silence that is chosen deliberate, but might be misread, by, might be appropriated for another person's hands, for parties, for for leaders' hands, rather than than speak what it wants to speak? Now, while I think that um, there's, there's something in this that cannot be totally put aside, because I think there, there, there are concerns here that are relevant, I think that the project of empowering silence through this transformation of silence into a clear message that the system might register uh, has its uh, shortcomings, right, and, and has its limitations. I wanted to say something about uh, first about the idea of power that is is underpinning this, and here you have a, an idea of power as control, right? As control uh, over something, and 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 you're trying to kind of. Uh, exercise control through silence by having a clear ma message that is registered, that uh, whose uptake is forced, right? Because it's clear and you cannot ignore it, but also that it, it implies costs to others, right? That it costs something. So think for instance of abstention, right? Abstention is normally not, not, not uh, collected, not, I mean, we kind of like said, no, the numbers are high and we, we are kind of have that worry concern moment, but it's kind of like then dismissed and, and then we return. There is a certain complacency of democracy with abstention. And it's, there are ways in which you can register the silence of abstention and make it communicative or try to make it. One is forced vote. And, and take away the right, to, I mean, internalize the right to silence so that it has to be exercised in a way that is registered rather than outside it. You can, for instance, um, introduce the blank vote when people can protest and then people can protest within the electoral system by ticking the none of the above and kind of register their, their silence as a form of protest, right? And you can try to, there are mechanisms or introduce uh, quite high thresholds where those that has a size power are empowered to kind of prevent the decision from being taken. You can do various ways in which you might empower silence in ways that become more costly, right? And that abstention is counted in and et cetera, in ways that it's not. But I think that all of these have quite limited results in the end and actually sometimes can backfire. 
for instance, think for of the of uh, there was a reference in Italy where the church told uh, believers to not participate because if you didn't attain the minimum threshold, you would invalidate the outcome. And here you can see like that not a vocal minority, but a silent minority can effectively be very conservative and maintain status quo. And that's what happened with, with so thresholds are, can work both ways, right? They can, and, and, and it's not, not a solution for, for all the problems that we envisage. So, there are mechanisms in which to give bite to silence, this ambiguous silence in the sense that political theory uh, scientists are looking, and to register it and make it uh, cause cause some damage to someone, so that so that people uh, take it into account and react and and and, and respond. But I think there is a limited um, kind of spectrum of things you can do to 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 do to do this make this work or make this work in the way they are expecting and here i think that what silence can do and more radically is to kind of change our understanding of uh, power and political agency and i think that that is something that they overlook so really instead of 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 seeing power as something you have possess as a size over silence can take you to think of power as something that holds people in a kind of relationship to one another a relationship of presence and attention to each other of a certain form and i think this is a different understanding of power and how we generate power and and uh, uh, what kind of things are required for that generation of power that 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 political theorists tend not to work with because they are still wanting to think of power as power over power to influence to have power to get determinate outcomes uh, out of your exercise of silence so there is a limit i think in, in political science to to political imagination where you are kind of just running with an understanding of power and trying to see if silence can deliver on it and i think that silence if it is to perform any fundamental and radical role is in altering under the understandings of power power is residing in situations rather than people for instance, right? When we keep silence together, the power is in the presence and the way in which we occupy space, the way in which we relate to each other in space, the way in which we interrupt time. And this is not anyone's. It's, it's, it's of the situation that we create acting together. So I think this produces changes in our understanding of, of agency through silence. I would also resist this idea, which I think it's still kind of pulling us back to the binary that if silence is to be powerful, it needs to be resistant. And all silence that is powerful is, is because it is resistant. Yes, silence very often offers a freedom from power by by hiding you, by by uh, by acting acting in ways that are ambiguous, by 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 protesting, by dissenting through silence and etc. That's a a function that silence can 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 perform in terms of political agency, but I would say, and this I, there is a kind of very very known text by Wendy Brown where she says, okay, silence has some power, but it's always a freedom from never a freedom to to constitute the world otherwise, to constitute political agency otherwise, to constitute society otherwise, and I think that's a big oversight. Uh, I don't want to take all the time, so I'll let other people come in. Just to sort of re recap, Monica, I think it seems to me what you're saying is that that any attempt to sort of translate silence simplistically into existing political frameworks is a sort of missed opportunity. And actually what silence can do is maybe transform the way we relate to each other on a sort of individual level, but much more broadly in sort of bigger understandings of political agency and political... I guess, interrelations in the political sphere. Yeah, sure. So that's exactly what I'm saying. So the attempt here is to transform silence into speech, to make it work like speech so that it registers, so that it influences political behavior from our leaders or from our, uh, of, uh, from our representatives. And I think that's, that's a very narrow way in which to see silence, because I think you need to see silence in the ways in which it is not like speech. It might work in ways differently, uh, different to speech, because silence is not just geared towards uh, communication, I think. Uh, communication is something that silence might, might do, but it does many other things. It's a way of being 
together in, in a different form, right? It, it's, it's an embodied form of action. And I think that is lost in this, in this understanding where everything is about turning silence, a communicative silence into an explicit message that will be registered and will influence power. So that's kind of the logic going here. And that's still kind of just drawing you back to a purely vocal model of politics where silence is going to be always very second best, right? I mean, because it, it, it just not, doesn't do those things as well, but these other things potentially much better, right? And, and that and, and the, the kind of explosive power of silence in doing those other things in changing our conceptualizations of what constitutes political power, right? Is very, is very different. I will give you a, a, an example, for instance, in terms of, um, so the ability to control and influence, right? Silence it might be a way when you restrain yourself and don't speak and let others speak, right? You are conceding a space for our others to influence and exercise their control. And that is, is, is a formidable uh, thing to do in terms of, of producing political community that is different from the one in which silence is a form of, in which speech can be a form of dominance and control. So people who speak without stopping and occupy the space, don't let space for others to, to, to occupy and to, to exercise influence, to persuade others about the claims they want to advance. So this is re reconstituting the regime of irritability and also the 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 the, the regime the, the regime that that is very much focused on speech and the power of speech and its exercise. Thanks, Rachel. I think you were about to jump in. It was ju it was just occurring to me, um, Monica, if I'm understanding rightly, your 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 in a sense, re um, I'm really attracted to this. Um, re constituting a model of political power taking silence as the key um metonym right really isn't it so 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 so, so, so we say what does a politics look like if we start from thinking about silence um, um so one of the the features that strikes me as obviously advantageous there as well as everything that you've already listed is the ecological possibility mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um so because you're talking about um embodied co-presence um uh, power in a situation power in a set of relationships and that can be um an ecological situation a set of ecological relationships right so it can go to the more than human and one doesn't need to think about including the more than human in politics simply in the mode of how do you give it a voice um, which can be problematic in all in all kinds of ways. So, 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 so that's one of the advantages. And then the other, the other side of what you're saying, which I think is fascinating, is that within that model, um, uh, speech is in the service of silence, right? So it's in the service of the kind of power that arises um, from um, uh, embodied co-presence in, in 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 this in this situation um and that feeds back in really interesting ways to what we we're talking about earlier the ways in which um bec because we talked about the vulnerability of silence you know one person speaks and then it, then it then it breaks the silence but then you're working towards an understanding in which um uh sort of speech and voice are included within um a larger vision that's that that's being labeled as a silence they're just picking up on a few a few points there i wondered whether i could just also take us back to a term you used right the early on monica where you referred to logocentrism and i think um on picking that is actually probably quite key to getting at the uh you know taking down this opposition between speech and silence where one might always be in the service of the shadow of the other because mm -hmm. listening to you talk about silence i was also thinking well many of the same things need to be said about speech and one of the big problems is that in the political philosophical tradition is that we identify the human as a rational speaking mm -hmm. um body with a particular notion really of what even speech or communication is, one that's tethered to this idea of rationality, but specifically also to logos in its other sense, which is of gathering something in a to into a totality. And we often forget this when we talk about logocentrism, that it's not simply an attachment to say voice over writing or voice over mere sound or rationality over irrationality, like the, the colonial version of it, or not even the version of like humanism, uh, as the human over the more than human or other than human, but that it's about producing these as a kind of totality, as if either speech or uh, 
non-speech or silence or sound or whatever is in that other, the category of the monstrous, of the colonized, the racialized, the preparized, mm -hmm. and so on, as if it could be formed into some kind of totality, or as if both those things, the whole and the excluded, could be totalities. And so it seems to me that I almost want to think of silence as that which ontologically precedes any of those distinctions. So precedes the distinction between speech and silence, precedes that distinction between logos and its monstrous, irrational other, or for, whether that's phone or whether that's kind of exotic barbaric speech or, or, or whatever, or music potentially. Uh, mimetic poetry, lamenting and wailing for Plato, mm -hmm. that he associates, right, with democracy. Mm -hmm. Not logos, but this wailing, this otherness, this, this madness. And I think, I like to think of silence, going back to that idea of it, racial, your idea of it as being a kind of well of potentiality, as something that kind of has the power to dismantle all those binaries in the sense mm -hmm. that it's a kind of shattering force that comes before before those distinctions. Um, but perhaps that that's, um, I noticed there was one of the questions coming up and I can say a bit more about whether that makes silence infinite or not. Um, but maybe I'll just stop there and, and see if other people want to add anything. I mean, I did wonder whether we could bring this round back to you, Rachel, thinking about sort of religious histories and traditions of silence and how they fit with the kind of conversations we've been having about absence and presence and potentiality. Well, yes, um, because there's this interesting, there's lots of ways you can go Sorry, with it's a big, it's a big question yeah, to bring lots, in lots of, lots, of, lots of ways you can go with it. And so, so, so one of the really, um, one of the things I was thinking through as Naomi was just speaking is the, um, the apophatic tradition in theology, right? So this is the, the speech about God, which is the failure of speech. Right. So, so 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 it's speaking in a way that dismantles speech. It's the God is not this and not that, or it's stating contradiction, stating con and juxtaposing contradictory claims with the intention of, 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 of demonstrating that they 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 break apart. So it's 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 um uh modes of speech that um you could argue that they aim at silence, but then what I think I think actually Naomi's um what Naomi's saying is clearer because the it's actually also aiming at pointing at that which lies beyond distinctions, including the distinction between speech and silence, right? <laughs> um, so it's not um, uh, bringing in silence to Trump's speech because that's actually already, um, that's a distinction between things, right? That's, that's, that's um, two boxes you can put world stuff in. And, 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 and the claim is that to, to speak of or to, to refer to, to, to God, um, if it's anything, is to refer to what lies beyond um, any set of distinctions within the world, including the distinction between speech and silence. So, so silence has got this really interesting doubleness um, mm -hmm. that it's both part of the world and it's the way that you gesture towards, towards transcendence, the way that you gesture beyond um, all the parts of world. So, 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 so it fits actually really nicely with what Naomi was just um, saying. Um, but then I think there's also, um, really uh there's, there's, there's also something really important about um the um understanding understanding um transcendence not just as as, as 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 emptiness um or you know what happens when you fall off the edge um and transcendence not not not, not just going to the bad infinite right um and the parallels between that and not seeing silence as lack right so um understanding within um say within within um uh, christian religious traditions various kinds of of, of 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 ways around um uh what is encountered in the transcendence of all of these kinds of oppositions is 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 not um just if you like dumbfoundedness the brick wall the brick wall of thought um it's something more like the um the opening up of potentiality right um, the opening up of a new kind of future um and that that's something which is if you like recognized and gestured towards in various sorts of practices of silence um that might be undertaken within within religious traditions so that's a huge um <laughs> that's a small gesture at a huge area 
Rachel, I want to follow up straight away with a question that we've had um, quoting you. Um, so it's a question from David Collins, who quotes you saying, Quakers claim that their continued adherence to certain practices, including silent unprogrammed worship, results from the continued or repeated experience that these practices work. So the question is, would you offer some reflection of the issue of whether such practices grounded in silence are about beliefs or about experiences that work? Yeah, um, so that, that that's quoting something that I wrote in case anybody's thinking they they missed something that I that I said earlier. Um, and um, so this is talking about um, Quaker worship for those who haven't experienced it um, within uh, the the unprogrammed tradition of, of 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 Quakerism. It is it is based on silence. There's a lot of silence. It's not silent in the sense that nobody's allowed to speak, it's silent until somebody is moved to speak, and sometimes somebody is and sometimes they aren't. Um, and that's actually quite important because um, it's this sense again of sil silence as openness, um, silence as um, you deliberately interrupt whatever is going on, you interrupt a whole set of um, kind of default narratives and settings, you also interrupt um, uh, whatever um, <laughs> ambient hierarchies of knowledge and power um, are operating and you gather as a community in silence and you see what happens. Um, so the, 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 the sense that it works um, is that um, uh, <laughs> prophecy and preaching and teaching um, emerges from the, from the silence um, and that um, uh, individuals and communities um, attain kinds of insight, kinds of understanding, kinds of being together, kind of um, leading towards action, um, which they didn't know they had. Now, that's um, is that is that beliefs, experiences, the work. That's I think that's experience of the work. There's a basic kind of trust there, though, right? Um, I mean, there's, there's a there's a basic there's a there's a basic trust that there's there's something to find. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, but that's um, not. It's. I think. I think. I think this is where Monica's point is really important about um, silence not being communicative in the same way that speech is. Um, so, this kind of practice of silence, and I would say certain other kinds of practice of silence um, within Christian tradition, maybe within other religious traditions. Um, it's not, um, oh, I do this in order to show that I believe X. That's not how it works. Um, uh, it's I, more like um, I do this as a way of orienting myself to something about how I think reality works. Um, but that's something about how I think reality works is... Um, it, the working of it is open-ended, right? I do this in the expectation it'll change me. Um, and that, that, so there's a kind of underlying belief, there's a kind of underlying trust, um, but it's primarily, um, so, so I, I mean, sorry, I'm going on a long time because now we're on to stuff that I've written about. I mean, I, I talk about, I talk about experimental, experimental knowing um, with this double meaning that the sort of 17th century style meaning to know something experimentally is to know it by experience, but then flipping it forward as well into the contemporary meaning, to say um, it's experimental in the sense of you're trying something on the basis of previous experience, so not at random, but with a genuine not knowing what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so building on what's happened before, there's a kind of there's a kind of trust there, but it's also it's open ended, future directed. To leave space for some other questions. Really. This got me thinking as you were speaking, Rachel. And you would know far more about this uh, than I do, but also the the shift in in Vatican II from the Tridentine Mass, where in the congregation, one would be silent largely you know, and pray in silence. And in fact, one may not even hear the muttering of the celebrant at all, compared with this idea in Vatican II that, that the prayer of the faithful needs to be kind of said out loud in some way with a kind of call and response pattern. And I, um, this is only outside my area of expertise, but just thinking of that also and how that then that idea about prayer and speech then fits with other parts of, of, of the Catholic tradition of the, of the Roman tradition. Um, 
that may include silent or under the breath recitation of the hours and the practice of walking along with uh, silent walking and meditation or of, uh, in monasteries, um, everyone being silent except the person reading the, the scripture reading and so on. And I'm sure you thought, I know you have thought a lot more about all these questions, but it just made me think about what was it maybe also about the politics of that moment in which Vatican II was embedded that put the spotlight on like the voice of the people or the voice of the congregation also needing to speak. Um, but yeah, it, it's not really, a, I'm not asking you to answer all of that, Rachel, but it just got me thinking about that and tying it in maybe with a certain political moment, um, but that it was tied around speech. I wonder whether we could come back to that question that you flagged up, Naomi, the, another question from, from one of our audience members, Philip Chan. So the way you were talking about the potentiality of silence seems to suggest that silence is the infinite form from which the finite emerges. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if anyone wants to, uh, to pick up on that, to address that. I, I can say so briefly, which is the, no, um, if only because I would adhere to the phrase la difference infinie est finie, uh, which is to say like infinite difference is finite. Um, so that I, as I was sort of trying to hint that I, for me at least, silence needs to deconstruct these oppositions, which would include this, this problem of uh, a, a kind of, of infinity as a kind of telos, but to suggest that infinity must necessarily reduce itself, hold itself back, is necessarily becomes kind of finite and the, therefore I would also say like it's impossible to kind of convert silence into speech or, or vice versa because silence or rather speech would just be that which automatically silences itself a bit um, this would be the sort of you know and, and therefore we cannot associate one or the other with the infinite or the finite but, but with a deconstruction of that but I think what's quite interesting is that phrase that I quoted actually gets misheard it's an example of like speech not being heard properly so almost as it were falling on deaf deaf ears because it was uttered by uh, the philosopher Jacques Derrida uh, on two occasions and, and then a friend of his, a close uh, compatriot, someone who knew his work well, still manages to misread that and to invert infini et fini uh, to end up saying that finite difference is infinite uh, and therefore to twist it towards the infinite. And this leads Derrida to retort, there's the reason for this comment, that there's a religion in Nancy's thought because he is determined to convert the finite and tilt it towards uh, the infinite. So I would say like, I want to resist that instead to deconstruct this opposition between the two. My, my, my colleagues here may have different answers, but uh, that would be mine. I would support totally that, but I, I wanted to engage with, a, with not a question, a comment, someone says that, um, an artist from China said, which we now have the freedom to keep quiet. And I, I, I find that really important because uh, a political theorist, uh, Benjamin Constant, when he speaks about, about the totalitarian or despotic systems, he says uh, the, the worst of them are not those that censor speech or go after speech. The worst of them are those that stop your right to silence and compel speech, therefore, right? And I think that's 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 quite important to think, for instance, in terms of the Miranda, uh, the, the Miranda warnings, right? They, they give you a right to speech and what uh, the right to silence, and what is this giving of a right to silence doing there? And one of the things that that if you read the, the Miranda opinion, you see that this is like conceived as a choice right, that there's a right to do both x and not a x where not x means refusing to do or accept x and this is a necessary albeit insufficient condition for making expressive choices so which means that your right to free speech is premised on the concession of a right to silence uh, and and I, I think i think really really this is uh, or to expressive speech speech that means anything the speech that is not compelled speech that is not parroting and this is is quite important um to see that because the, the right to silence is behind also the right to, the 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 right to free thought, free speech, but also association. And that's important because it comes with the secret, right? Associations depend on keeping secrets as well and knowing what we don't say and what you say to produce the associative link between or the bond between people. And um, and, and uh, there are some court cases in America um, during the Red Square 
that scare, sorry, square, the red scare, where, where, where some of the lawyers use this, right? That the right to keep secrets is extremely important mm -hmm. as a foundation of associational life. Isn't there something, uh, it never occurred to me before, but isn't there something really, you said there's something about the connection between the right to make, to make, to keep silent and, um, some sense of fundamental human dignity, right? Or the, the right not to be instrumentalized, right? The mm -hmm. right not to give you something you can use uh, of me, um, not to give you a way of using my voice. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right not to be um, reduced to what I say. Um, there's something about the link between the right to remain silent and the the right to we, we go on using this language or the 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 the, the, the need to be recognised simply as being here, yeah, um, and 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 to be to be to be accepted to be recognised before um, you've done anything in particular, said anything in particular, been anything in particular, fitted yourself in any particular kind of way into um, the society or the system mm -hmm. that we've that we've got. Um, so there might be something. Yeah, really quite basic about this 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 um uh the acquisition of the right of the right to silence and how people understand why that matters to people and what they understand it to have to have given them rachel that's really interesting because some supreme court rulings uh on the right to free speech, they exactly use the right to silence as preventing instrumentalization so that you become a vehicle of state propaganda. And to stop that, you need to give the right to silence. So exactly that worry and concern about instrumentalization and making you speak the words of others. A connected question uh, from one of our audience members. So politically speaking, can silence be a mode of resistance and opposition as, quote, the pure form of negation or refusal to engage, leaning on Marcuse's, quote, refusal? Or is it then more likely to be interpreted or misunderstood as a form of surrender or even complicity? So yeah, that's for you, Monica, come on. Okay, so I can I can have a go at it. So fundamentally, I think here, one of the questions is that audiences interpret the right to silence in such and such ways. And now do you prevent certain interpretations that are against what you might be doing, right? So if you are resisting, right, you that intention and needs to come through. And how do, how do, you, how do you do that by right? exercising the right to silence, right? which can be said to be a, a form of complicity. And I think here there is an important thing, which is to confer visibility to, I mean, some resistance when, it, when it's a form of protest, right? Some of the power in the right, in exercising the right to silence is, uh, is not, doesn't require visibility. For instance, when, when you don't fill out a document that the state sends you because you don't want to give the state that information because, because you think you shouldn't have that information and therefore you, you kind of don't say or say in ambiguous ways and et cetera. So that's, that's a way in which to resist, right? But, but, it's, but it's a form of refusing to, to speak, refusing to give information and et cetera. But if we are thinking of resistance as protest, right? Then that kind of resistance depends on some visibility to the act of protesting. And, and, and some signification that it's an, an, an act of protest. And I, I think that that there it's very hard to to um to kind of transform it or read it as complicity. Right? I mean, think for instance of the feminist uh, silent protest tradition from the sil silent sentinels to, to the, the women in black and all they exercise. So this is really a rupture in the world as is by being present in a different way in public space signaling and in the case of the silent sentinels very clearly that you want don't want to be co-opted by continuing to engage in civil conversation with the government and instead of making noise and being ostracized and marginalized by that as other feminists have been you exercise the right to silence very visibly very publicly and in in, in amongst that you also appropriate the president's words and show how hypocritical and uh, they are by um, making yourself as the subject of those words and, and, and putting those claims in your own mouth of a collective subject. So this process is process of mimicking, subverting and etc. with this silence as a backdrop to it. And it's not a passive backdrop, it's doing loads of work in this. And I think this is the kind of resistance that could never be taken for complicity. There's no place for that. 
for you know, for that it is allows that kind of reading. I think there's some, there's some really interesting challenges, don't you think, in how how silence in that political silence of that kind of resistance silence is made visible um, in a social media age, right? I mean, what does <laughs> what does that even look? Are there some public spaces in which it's really hard to do um, visible um, and noticeable silence? I think I was also going to say, I maybe slightly modify that. I think that maybe any silence that is powerful as a form of resistance or dissidence has to take the risk of complicity. Like, I, <laughs> I think anything that imagines it can kind of be safely on one side or the other, like as a pure form of refusal or something like this. And when you see this kind of rhetoric from the autonomists, to me, it, it feels so ensnared in metaphysics that it's already conceded the terms of politics to the oppressor in a way, as if it imagines the only thing is this kind of blind negation. Mm -hmm. And rather, I suppose I'd be much more interested in forms of silence or withdrawal or quiet uh, from the black radical tradition or from decolonial traditions, like ideas of fugitivity, silence as a form of kind of evasion or withdrawal or fugal kind of like Fred Moten's kind of discussions of certain kinds of sound or sonic withdrawal or like marunage. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, I, I think the it can express a certain kind of yeah, slipperiness that doesn't have to be sort of full frontal, right? Um, uh, but the other form, the, the, the refusal that I was talking about was perhaps less kind of like head on as negation and more a kind of like unyieldingness or resolute uh, kind of response that I think can go like hand in hand as a, with a set of tactics that would include fugitivity and marinage, but uh, mm -hmm. as a, and might also fit with this. Um, not only like the right to be silent under Miranda rights, but also perhaps the right to another related set of rights that Lawrence Abu Hamdan, a sound artist, tries to bring out, which is not just when he's talking about Miranda rights, he talks about what about the right to be heard in a certain way, or the right not to be misheard, or perhaps the right deliberately to kind of set up risks of mishearing. And I think those kind of it, more dispersive set of repertoires mm -hmm. around silence kind of interests me uh, politically, mm -hmm. uh, as well as kind of symbolic refusals, which I think perhaps have limited, limited political potential actually. I want to finish with one question. Uh, so once upon a time in England, there was quiet, the quiet hum of English voices in a pub. When and why did it become necessary here to have music, noise, filler, sounds, the absence of silence? The absence of quiet in England, even in urban London, represents a massive cultural shift. What happened and why? You've got two minutes to solve this. You could think of a breakdown of community because it being comfortable in silence with one another requires some level of community making that might not be there and you need to fill in the the, the space that is created by that those broken links with with sound so i mean that could be a way of reading i don't know if that's what's happening but it could be one way of reading it i have a more controversial answer this is a nostalgic fantasy. Um, and the reason that it seemed relatively quiet was because uh, the capitalist class was quite comfort, confident and comfortable in its uh, domination. And if we think about like increasing liberation movements and social movements, like the need to colonize public space through determining kinds of attention using like uh, Muzak and things like that is a, a sign of like an attempt to, for capital to reconfigure itself, try and maintain control and domination. Um, so like may maybe I just think it's a, you know, it's, it's symptomatic of that. Or if we tell this kind of narrative about some kind of decline in the quality of our soundscapes, it, it also potentially is entangled with quite reactionary politics that we might want to uh, mm -hmm. interrogate a little. So I'm being a little bit like tongue in cheek and a bit difficult, but it was the last two minutes. <laughs> I think that on that provocative <laughs> on that provocative note, we're going to have to finish. I'm so sorry if I didn't get to your question. Thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you all for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Good evening.